Hello and welcome to a horribly nerdy podcast, the podcast that's so bad, horrible is in its name. And if you've been following along on my social media, then you will understand I have been having some mental health issues and that is kind of why, well, the reason that today's episode is delayed is because when I went to hit upload, I accidentally hit delete and I have to re-record re-edit and re-upload this episode so yeah that's why it's been delayed and i do apologize for that um you may be asking like hey you know that's your personal business you don't have to tell us about your mental health but the truth is i do tell you because i will always be straight with my listeners and i'll always be honest with my listeners and um i want you know if you're struggling like i am right now you're not alone and no matter how dark things seem And no matter uh, how horrible things seem, there is always a way up. And right now, uh, that's what I'm doing. I'm making changes to uh, better reflect my mental health and my physical well-being. uh, Because my mental health was starting to affect me physically. And uh, yeah, so I'm going to be making changes in the next coming weeks to, you know, next coming weeks, months, all of that to uh, reflect that. And, uh, you know, if you need help, reach out for help. Uh, that's what I, I'll be honest. That's what I'm doing. I'm, uh, contacting therapists and psychiatrists and all that to get the help I need. So I highly recommend you do the same. So continuing with our women in history month, and I know we've been talking a lot, a lot of horror lately, and uh, we're going to talk about more horror today because I'm a horror fan and these are some of my favorite people in the world. And so I couldn't not talk about them. So today, let's talk about Adrienne Barbeau, one of the best scream queens out there. Barbeau was born on June 11th, 1945 in Sacramento, California, the daughter of Armini Nalbandian and Joseph Barbeau. Uh, who was a public relations executive for Mobile Oil. Her mother was of Armenian descent, and her father's ancestry was French, Canadian, Irish, and German. Uh, She has a sister, Jocelyn, and a half-brother on her father's side, Robert Barbeau, who still resides in the Sacramento area. She attended Del Mar High School in San Jose, California, and her autobiography, Barbeau, states... Barbeau states that the first she caught the show business bug while entertaining troops at army bases throughout Southeast Asia, touring with the San Jose Civic Light Opera. Uh, In the late 1960s, Barbeau moved to New York City and worked for the mob as a go-to and worked for the mob as a go-go dancer. She made her Broadway debut in the chorus of Fiddler on the Roof, and later took the role of Hodel, Tevya's daughter. Bette Midler played her character's sister, Setsil. She left Fiddler in 1971 to play the reading, to play the leading role of Cookie Kovac in the off-Broadway nudie musical Stag Movie. Barbeau as Cookie Kovac and Brad Sullivan as Rip Cord were quite jolly and deserved to be congratulated on the lack of embarrassment they show when on occasion they had to wander around stark naked. They may not be sexy, but they certainly keep cheerful, wrote the New York Times theater critic Clive Bards in an otherwise negative review. Uh, I don't know what he was looking at. (sighs) Some people. Barbeau went on to star in more than 25 musicals and plays, including Women Behind Bars, The Best Little Whorehouse in Texas, and Grease. She received a Theater World Award and a 1972 Tony World nomination for her portrayal of tough girl Rizzo in Grease. During the 1970s, Barbeau starred as Carolyn Trainer, the daughter of B. Arthur's title character on the comedy series Maud, which ran from 1972 to 1978. Actress Marsha Rod, Marsha Rod has original. <laughs> Actress Marsha Rod had a, I have a little tongue tie problem here. Uh, actress Marsha Rod had originated the role of Carol in a 1972 episode of All in the Family, also titled Maud, alongside Arthur. Uh, in her autobiography, There Are Worse Things I Could Do, Barbo remarked, 
What I didn't know is that when I said my lines, I was usually walking down a flight of stairs and no one was even listening to me. They were just watching my breasts perceive me. During the last season of Maud, Barbeau did not appear in a majority of the episodes. In a 2009 Entertainment Tonight TV interview, Barbeau mentioned that she had a gun on and off chemistry with Arthur. Uh, she said that the two stayed close until Arthur's death on April 25th, 2009. Barbeau and Arthur reunited on camera during a 2007 taping of The View, reminiscing about their long-running friendship and their years as co-stars on Maud. About her relationship with Arthur, Barbeau said in a 2018 interview with Dread Central, I was doing an interview for this one-woman show. Uh, and the interview asked, What do people usually ask you? And I said, They always want to know what it was like working with me. She was fantastic, and you know, I realized years later how much I took it for granted because it was my first experience on television. I just assumed that everyone was as giving as she was, as professional as she was, that everyone who was doing a TV show showed up knowing their lines, showed up on time, and was willing to say to the writers, I think this line was funnier if Addie had said it, or Conrad had said it, or Bill had said it. I mean, she was just the best. She was the best, very funny. She was not Maud when she wasn't saying those lines. I don't know if I'd say she was quiet. She was a homebody. She had her sons, her dog, and her cooking. And she wasn't into the celebrity scene. And she was a great lady. I loved her dearly. And we had a great cast. And they were my family for six years. I loved each of them and all of them. And it was the best experience anyone could have had being introduced to television like that. Barbeau was cast in numerous television films and series such as The Love Boat, Fantasy Island, Valentine Magic on Love Island, and Battle of the Network Stars. In her autobiography, she claimed, I actually thought CBS asked me to be on Battle of the Network Stars because they thought I was athletic. My husband clued me in, who cared if I won the race as long as I bounced when I ran. Tells you something about those times, huh? The popularity of Barbo's 1978 Cheesecake poster confirmed her status as a sex symbol. Barbo's popularity stemmed partly from what critic Joe Bob Briggs referred to as two enormous talents on that woman and her typecasting as a tough broad. Despite her initial success, she said at the time she thought of Hollywood as a flesh market and that they would rather appear in films that explore the human condition and deal with with the issues. I'm sorry, she would rather appear in films that explore the human condition and deal with issue, issues. Barbo's then husband, director John Carpenter, cast her in his horror film The Fog, which was her first theatrical film appearance. The film was released on February 1st, 1980, and was a theatrical su success, grossing over $21 million in the United States alone, and establishing Barbeau as a genre film star. Now that's interesting. Back in the 80s, $21 million was a, suggest, was a success, whereas now we would consider that a flop. How interesting. She subsequently appeared in a number of early 1980s horror and science fiction films, a number of which now became cult film classics, including Escape from New York, Creep Show, Creep Show, and Swamp Thing. Of her screen work with Carpenter, Barbo has stated, John is a great director. He knows what he wants, and he knows how to get it. It's simple, and it's easy working with him. She also appeared in the high-grossing Burt Reynolds comedy, The Cannonball Run, as as the shrewish wife of Rodney Dangerfield's character in Back to School. Barbo also starred alongside future talk show host Bill Maher and actress and model Shannon Tweed in the comedy Cannibal Women in the Avocado Jungle of Death in 1989. In the 1990s, Barbo mostly appeared in made-for-television films such as Scott Turrell's Burden of Proof and as well as playing Oswald Mother on The Drew Carey Show and gaining new fame among animation fans as Catwoman on Batman the Animated Series and Gotham Girls. She also worked on a television talk show host, I'm sorry, she also worked as a television talk show host and a weekly book reviewer on the KABC Talk Radio in Los Angeles. In 1999, she guest starred in the Star Trek Deep Space Nine episode, Inter Arma Enum Silent Legus, as a Romulan Senator Kamara Kratak. In 1980, no, sorry, you're going to find there's very limited editing on this episode because I'm rushing to get it done and that's why I'm stumbling so much. 
I apologize. Uh, in 1998, Barbo released her debut album as a folk singer, the self-titled Adrian Barbo. She starred in the cartoon series Totally Spies, doing the, vil- doing the voice of villainous Helga von Guggen in seasons 1, 2, and 4. Uh, from 2003 to 2005, she starred on the HBO series Carnival. From March to May 2006, she, por- she starred as Judy Garland in the off-Broadway play The Property, known as Garland. In 2007, Barbo played a cameo role in Rob Zombie's Halloween, a reimagining of the 1978 film of the same name written and directed by her first husband, John Carpenter. Her scene was unfortunately cut from the theatrical version of the film, but is included in later releases. Uh, in 2009, Barbo was cast as the cat lady in the family comedy The Dog Who Saved Christmas, as Scooter's mom in the 3D animated feature Fly Me to the Moon, and as a hospice chase patient in the love story Reach For Me. Uh, in 2009, she had guest spots in the first episode of Showtime's hit series Dexter, she voiced the Greek goddess Hera in the video game God of War, released for PlayStation uh, PlayStation 3 in March 2010. In August 2010, she began a role on the long-running ABC daytime drama General Hospital. In 2012, she voiced UNSC scientist Dr. Tilson in the highly anticipated game Halo 4 released on the Xbox 360 in November of 2012, and in 2015, she voiced characters in the Mad Max video game. She speaks in Argo, playing the former wife of Alan Arkin's character. She reprises her role as Catwoman in an animated remake of the third trailer for The Dark Knight Rises. The trailer was... This trailer was made to both celebrate the upcoming movie as well as to promote Hub's 10-episode marathon of Batman the Animated Series. In 2015, she assumed the role of Burf and Pippin with the Broadway touring company of the renowned musical. Uh, As said before, she was married to John Carpenter from 1979 to 1984, where they, uh, they met on the set of his television movie, Someone's Watching Me. They had a son, John Cody Carpenter, in 1984, shortly before they separated. Uh, during their mod- during their marriage, the couple lived in the Hollywood Hills, but according to Barbo, remained totally outside Hollywood's social circles. Uh, she then married actor, playwright, producer... I'm sorry, then married actor, playwright, producer, Billy Van Zant, 12 years his junior... I'm sorry, 12 years her junior, on December 31st, 1992. The two met in 1991 when Barbo was cast in the West Coast premiere of his play Drop Dead. Van Zant is the half-brother of musician-actor Stephen Van Zant. She gave birth to twin boys Walker Stephen and William Dalton Van Zant on March 17, 1997 at age 51, quipping that she was the only one in the maternity ward who was also a member of AARP. And unfortunately, the couple filed for divorce in 2018. Let's talk about her most notable horror roles. The Fog. Classic film movie. Classic film movie? Oh my god, like I'm sorry people, like I said, my brain is frazzled. I promise next week's episode will hopefully be th- <coughs> oh, excuse me. Hopefully be a thousand times better. The Fog, a classic movie, atmospheric, amazing sound design, a soundtrack, amazing score, I should say, everything about it, awesome, acting is brilliant, The Fog, Tom Atkins, Adrian Barbeau, William Malone, and Jamie Lee Curtis, how can you go wrong? The Thing, supposedly, I don't know if this is true or not, I've never really seen it for sure confirm, but she is the voice of one of the computers in The Thing. She was Wilma Northup in the uh, in the segment The Crate of Creep Show, which is one of the best segments. Well, that whole movie is amazing, so never mind. But her character, Stevie... I'm sorry, I'm thinking of something else. That's Stevie Wayne is the fog, I'm sorry. <laughs> Wilma uh, is this kind of 
overbearing, dominating female character, and her husband uh, just can't put up with it anymore. There are some pretty funny fantasy, little fantasy tidbits in there uh, that her husband has, and she's just fantastic in that role. Um, two Evil Eyes. The facts in the case of Mr. Valdemir. Two Evil Eyes is really, really good. Uh, this was when two directors, George A. Romero and Dario Argento, decided to tackle the works of Edgar Allan Poe. Uh, I really love the facts in the case of M. Valdemir. Um, that segment is really, really good. And while... The Black Cat is okay. I, I'm not a bigger fan of it because of the animal cruelty aspects of it. Um, again, none of which are confirmed, but from what you can tell, it seemed like there were some actual cruelty to animals on set. And as we know in the, from the past, I'm not a fan. She uh, played Simone Lenore uh, from the direct-to-video Zombie Scooby Doo on Zombie Island. I almost said Zombie Doo on Scooby Island. Oh my god, my brain. <laughs> Scooby Doo on Zombie Island. Great film. I love that movie. I will watch it all the time. And of course, uh, in Halloween. Uh, there are more, but those are the biggies, in my opinion. Um, she has, like, her whole filmography is just great. Check it out. Fantastic and everything she's done. Love, Adrian Arbo. Next, we're going to be talking about... Uh, one of the best Scream Queens out there. And I always know, I say pretty much everyone, one of the best, but come on. It's Jamie Lee Curtis. How can we not talk about Jamie Lee Curtis? Born in Santa Monica, California, to actor Tony Curtis and actress Janet Lee. Her father was Jewish, the son of Hungarian Jewish immigrants. Two of her maternal great-grandparents were Danish, while the rest of her mother's ancestry is German and Scots-Irish. Curtis has an older sister, Kelly Curtis, who is also an actress, and several half-siblings, all from her father's remarriages. Alexandra, actress Allegra Curtis, Benjamin and Nicole, Nicholas Curtis, who unfortunately passed away of a drug overdose in 1994. Uh, Curtis's parents divorced in 1962. After the voice she, divorce, she stated her father was not around and that he was not interested in being a father. She was raised by her mother and her stepfather, stockbroker Robert Brand. Uh, Curtis was very wealthy growing up and attended elite schools like Westlake School, now known as Harvard Westlake, and Beverly Hills High School in Los Angeles, and graduated from Chote Rosemary Hall in Connecticut in 1976. Returning in California, I'm sorry, returning to California in 76, she attended her mother's alma mater, the University of the Pacific in Stockton, California, and studied law. She dropped out after one semester to pursue, to pursue an acting career. Curtis's film debut occurred in the 1978 horror film Halloween, in which she played the role of Laurie Strode. The film was a major success and was considered the highest grossing independent film of its time, earning accolades as a classic horror film. The producer, Deborah, the producer, <laughs> just, I'm sorry, I lost track because I realized I said the producer, which reminded me of Medusa, and I went, I, I had a really weird image in my head anyways. The producer, Deborah Hill, specifically cast Curtis because her mother, Lee, had been known as a horror icon. Curtis was subsequently, sub, subsequently cast subsequently cast in several horror films, garnering her the title Scream Queen. She would return to the Hollow Eyes. Oh my god, I apologize, people. My brain. I might have to take a week off or something. Good lord. No, I'm not going to do that. Anyways, uh, she played Strode again in the sequels Halloween 2, uh, Halloween HT, H2O, 20 years later, Halloween Resurrection, the Halloween 2018, 
and Halloween Kills 2021, and having an uncredited voice role in Halloween 3 Season of the Witch. And of course, as we now know, uh, Halloween H2O and Halloween Resurrection are no longer canon in the Halloween franchise. Uh, her next film following Halloween was one we mentioned earlier, The Fog, which was helmed by Halloween director John Carpenter. The horror film opened in February 1980 to mixed reviews, but strong box office. Uh, starting Curtis as a horror film startlet. Starlet. Oh my god. Her next film, Prom Night, was a low-budget Canadian slasher film released in July of 1980. The film for which she earned a Genie Award nomination for Best Performance by a Foreign Actress was similar in style to Halloween, yet received negative reviews which marked it as a disposable entry in the then-popular slasher genre. Uh, that year, Curtis also starred in Terror Train, which opened in October and met with negative reviews akin to Prom Night. Both films perform moderately well at the box office. Curtis' roles in the latter two films served as a similar function to that of Strode, the main characters whose friends are murdered and is practically the only protagonist to survive. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, film critic Robert... Ro <sighs> oh my god, I might have to end it after this. I'm screwing up so much. This might be a super short episode. I, I, I really apologize, people. I'm just... Like I said, my mental health issues are really getting to me. Um, <laughs> film critic Roger Ebert, who gave negative reviews to all three of Curtis's 1980 films, said that Curtis is the current horror film glut what Christopher Lee was to the last one, or Boris Karloff was in the 1930s. Uh, in 1981, she appeared alongside Stacey Keach in the Australian thriller film Road Games, uh, directed by Carpenter's friend Richard Franklin. Her importation, which was requested by the film's American distributor AVCO Embassy Pictures, was contested by the Sydney branch of Actors' Equity. Although the film was a box office bomb in Australia and Franklin later regretted not increasing the size of Curtis's roles, it has achieved a cult following and was championed by Quentin Tarantino. Tarantino. I said that right the first time, sorry. Excuse me. Uh, her role in 1983's Trading Places helped Curtis shed her horror queen image and garnered a, her a BAFTA award for Best Actress in a Supporting Role, in which then she went on to do more comedies like A Fish Called Wanda, which achieved cult status showing, which achieved cult status while showcasing her as a comedic actress uh, for her performance. <laughs> Oh my god! For her performance, she was nominated for the BAFTA Award for Best Actress in a Leading Role. And A Fish Called Wanda is a hilarious movie. I definitely recommend it. Uh, Curtis received positive reviews for her performance in the action thriller Blue Steel, which was directed by Catherine Bigelow. She also received a Golden Globe Award for her work in the 1994 action comedy film True Lies, directed by James Cameron, and is one of the funniest action films of all time. Her other film roles also include the coming-of-age film My Girl and My Girl 2, the Disney comedy film Freaky Friday opposite Lindsay Lohan. The latter was filmed at Palisades High School in Pacific Palisades, California, near where Curtis and her guest lived with their children. Uh, she was nominated for a Golden Globe Award for Best Actress, Motion Picture Comedy, or Musical. Uh, she starred in the Christmas comedy... Christmas with the Kank, Christmas with the Cranks, which went on to gain a cult. Following, in October 2006, Curtis told Access Hollywood that she had closed the books on her acting career to focus on her family. She did return to acting after being cast in June 2007 live-action film Beverly Hills Chihuahua, and also starred in the comedy film You Again in 2010, opposite Kristen Bell and Sigourney Weaver. She had voice roles in The Little Engine That Could and From Up on Poppy Hill, and had supporting roles in the neo-noir mystery film Veronica Mars and the biograph biographical drama Spare Parts. 
she returned to leading roles with her reprisal of Laurie Strode in the horror sequel film Halloween 2018. Uh, the film debuted to $76.2 million, marking the second best opening weekend of October and the highest opening weekend of the Halloween franchise, becoming the highest grossing in the franchise. Its opening performance was the best ever for a starring lead actress over 55 years old. Curtis's performance earned critical acclaim. Also in 2018, she had a role in the drama film Inacceptable Loss. She then starred as Linda Drysdale Thomberry in Rian Johnson's mystery film Knives Out, which earned critical acclaim and over $300 million at the global box office. In September 2021, she was honored with the Golden Lion at the Venice Film Festival for her lifetime achievements. Curtis again reprised her role as Laurie Strode in the horror sequel Halloween Kills, which was released in October 2021 and is set to play the character again in Halloween Ends, which is set to be released in October of 2022. She also is working with an illustrator named Laura Cornell and has written a number of children's books. Uh, when I Was Little, a four-year-old's memoir of her youth, 1993. Uh, Tell Me Again About the Night I Was Born in 1996. And much more, uh, all the way up to 2018. Uh, invention in 1987, Curtis filed a U.S. patent application for the modification of a diaper with a moisture-proof pocket containing wipes that can be taken out and used one hand. Curtis refused to allow her invention to be marketed until companies started selling biodegradable diapers. The full statutory term of the patent expired February 20, 2007, and is now in the public domain. She filed a second U.S. patent application related to disposable diapers in 2016, and on November Oh, and she was issued a patent on November 28th, 2017. That will expire September 7th, 2036. Let's get into her, her personal life, and then I think we're going to wrap up this episode because I have been fucking up terribly. So I uh, truly apologize. Uh, Curtis married Christopher Guest on December 18th, 1984. She saw a picture of him from the movie This Is Spinal Tap and Rolling Stone and told her friend Deborah Hill, Oh, I'm going to marry that guy. She married him five months later. They have two adopted daughters, Annie, born in 1986, and Ro Ruby, who is transgender, born in 1996. Uh, Curtis is actor Jake Gyllenhaal's godmother. Her father-in-law was of uh, British. <sighs> Sorry, folks. Her father-in-law was a British hereditary peer when he died on April 8, 1996. Her husband succeeded him and became the fifth Baron Hayden Guest. By marriage, she takes on the title Baroness Hayden Guest of Sailing in Essex. As the wife of a peer, she is styled the Right Honorable the Lady Hayden Guest. Uh, Curtis rejects the idea of using the title, saying, It's got nothing to do with me. She is close friends with actress Sigourney Weaver in a 2015 interview. She said she never watched Weaver's film Alien as entirely because she is too scared by it. Fair enough, Alien is a haunting movie, but still an amazing movie. Uh, Curtis is a recovering alcoholic and was addicted to painkillers. Uh, she became sober from opiates in 1999 and at reading and relating to Tom Kirilla's account of addiction, and maintains that recovery is the greatest achievement of her life. Uh, after her father Tony's death, she learned that her entire family, including siblings, had been cut out of his will. That's kind of... Yeah, that's kind of dickish. Uh, she is a massive fan of World of Warcraft, One Piece, and has attended many Comic-Cons. Incognito. <laughs> go, go, Jamie Lee Curtis. That's badass. All right, I'm, I'm literally going to wrap this up. My brain is just gone. There was a lot more I wanted to get into. I was going to do a couple uh, female horror authors and stuff like that. But honestly, like, uh, I'll maybe I'll record those tomorrow and, and the next day and have them uploaded as a separate podcast. But my brain is fried and frazzled. I appreciate you all hanging in there with me. Uh, 
honestly, the, the love and support I've been seeing from everyone, all the comments and everything, you are all super amazing. You've been so nice. I truly appreciate you all. You have no idea how much it means to me. Um, I've been crying a lot, and it's not sad tears. It's happy tears seeing all the positivity and support being sent my way. You have no idea how much that means to me. Like, le like legitimately, it, it has saved my life more than one time. But thank you all so much for tuning in to a horribly nerdy podcast. I promise next week episode will, should be better. <laughs> thank you all again. I just... Well, I'll keep you all updated, but hopefully within the next few weeks I'll have some really good news for you all. And we'll see changes coming and all that, but I will definitely keep you all updated. Thank you so much for listening, and we'll see you next week.